Flatpak Refix the Future is a narrative role-playing game where you and up to four friends get together. For a few hours, you all pretend that you're the youths, wrenches by title, born after the end of the world. You've gumption and bravery to go out into the waste and wilds and rebuild a better world for everyone. You, the people at the table, are the players. You'll take on roles, roll dice, and narrate the adventures of these plucky wrenches. One of you players will also take on the role of the director. You'll provide story hooks, manage character challenges, and just be the biggest fans of the stories that are you are all creating around the table. The director role can also change hands between players between episodes, so that no one person has ended up handed all of the extra work. You're all in this together, after all. As for what you'll need at the table, well, that depends on what your table is if it's literal, or if you're playing in a Discord call or even on a message board. In general, you'll need a whole bunch of polyhedron dice. Six-sided, eight-sided, ten-sided, and twelve-sided. You'll want a copy of Flatpak Refix the Future, of course. We split that into five manuals to make it easier to pass around the table, if it's physical. Or faster to read if it's in PDF, because you can just skip the manuals you don't need. You'll also need some scraps of paper and tokens to represent your widgets. Everything else can be done on player mat, character sheet, or just piece of paper and pencil. Or glitter pen if you're up to it. One other quick tidbit. When you're talking as a player to each other, talking about life, the dice, or the shared snacks around the table, we call that an out-of-story conversation. When you're speaking as your character, or narrating what they're doing inside of the story, well, we call that in-story. How much you explain out of story and how much you narrate in story is up to you, your comfort, and the needs of everyone playing. Flatpak Refix the Future is what we like to call optimistic post-apocalyptic storytelling. What the heck does that mean and why make an all-ages game about such a grim topic? Listen, I didn't invent the idea of taking young characters, putting them into a weird and dangerous world, and telling them narratively, without hesitation, that they can make those things better. Have you read The Hunger Games? Or even The Giver? What about Wally and Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind? Things are rough out there. Kids live through COVID and wars, political upheavals, economic stress, just like the rest of us. Rather than pretending that that stuff never happened, or ignoring threats like climate change and fossil fuel dependency, why not raise a generation of kids who look at these problems as something to solve, not just something to give up over? Kids who know deep down that a better world is possible are the kids who can make it through whatever comes next in the story of their lives. Flatpak is written and intended to be played by an all-ages group. If you are in the unfortunate situation of not having any young gamers to play with, that's okay. You can play it with a group of olds, but if you are playing with a diversity of ages and abilities, consider your tone, optimistic, and your patience first and foremost. And if you're wondering, well, what ended the world in Flatpak Refix the Future? I'm telling you, you're asking the wrong question. It doesn't matter how that world ended. It matters what we're doing to build the next one. To play a character in Flatpak Refix the Future, you're going to have to design a character to play. But don't worry, it's easy and we've got tons of tools to help. For the sake of recording and tracking character design and character progress, you'll want what we call a Rex sheet. Rex, like record like that permanent record teachers were always warning you about back in school. You'll eventually need a character name, you'll jot down pronouns if any, and make a tagline that makes your character unique in a sentence or less. Yeah, you can do any part of this at any stage of design or change your mind whenever. Now, taglines become true once your Rex is finalized. So if you're, say, the fastest wrench in the West, a gamester elite, twitchy, witchy, and fun, or anything like that. Guess what? It's true. You are elite, or whatever. 
you'll need to jot down how your wrench did in their training program with letter grades. And I'll go over those in more specific detail a little bit later. You'll pick a glitch with a specific benefit that will inform how you engage with the dice a little bit different than other characters. That's in Manual B on page 12. Your Rex is also where you'll track your heart shards, your scraps, your widgets, you know, all of those good thingies you've got in your tool belt. The other thing you'll do at this stage is pick two random flat packs that you're going to start off with. More on that at another time. And that's it. Easy peasy dust cloud sneezy. It's not about where you're from, but it can be about where you've been. In Flatpak Refix the Future, your characters, the wrenches, grew up in some kind of sheltered community that protects them from the worst of the apocalypse as it went down. The where is less important than the who, but sometimes the space that you inhabit influences the communities that get built. These places you grew up were your furusato, a Japanese loan word meaning basically hometown. Your community, your upbringing, your education, and your wrench training. And of course, the population of people that you're rebuilding for at first. Here are some common furusato for wrenches. Community shelters. Those who grew up in community shelters learn very quickly how to make do and work together to get by. Rubble towns. Those who grew up in rubble towns have the benefit of a wrench-style upbringing, but otherwise survived in the rough-and-tumble world outside of shelters and vaults. Astrahi Hereford Arcology Hometowns, TM. Those who grew up in arcologies had a soft upbringing, but with a lot of pressure to live up to certain standards, as well as this fishbowl-like feeling of often being watched. Privacy is very rare in an AHAH. V-A-L-U-E Citizen Preservation Vaults were built by the government in the before times. Wrenches who grew up in a vault are really good at challenging authority because the olds in those vaults are just so attached to their old ways. It's necessary for someone to step up and propose new ideas. That's not an exhaustive list of all of the places a wrench could grow up, but it's a good start. Generally, all of the wrenches in a crew are from the same furisato. Once per episode, when a problem aligns nicely, a wrench can remind their crew of a lesson they learned back home. This can grant each of the wrenches one heart shard back or a d6 gadget. Nice. Now wrenches get some training before they're sent out into the waste and wilds to adventure, learn, make the world better, and of course, collect flat pack self-building community constructs. Just like in the before times, Wrench's training is divided into subjects, and how well you did in your subject will help indicate what you're good at when you're out in the world. Here's a real quick description of those subjects. Rascalin is your subject for learning about bending the rules, thinking outside of the box, sneaking around, or otherwise causing healthy trouble. Rhythmetic is your subject for learning maths, logic, critical thinking, and lots of smart kid stuff. Electrics is your subject for learning about before times technology and how to make it work today. Max is your subject for learning about entertaining, creating beautiful things, telling stories, and all of those little parts of amusement that make a people, a culture. Civics is your subject for learning history, anthropology, public speaking, and kindness. Health and fitness covers going, climbing, growing, and showing your physical intelligence. That all spells wrench, by the way, because I am a very clever game designer. When you're designing your character, you'll grade how well they did in the following spread. 1A, 2Bs, 3Cs, and 1D. D means did your best, not, you know, something nastier. When building your role, which I'll explain more later, each of those letter grades is a bonus to your die roll, from a D granting you a plus one to an A that grants you a plus four. Now that's making the grade. 
And now some director's information for Flatpak Refix the Future. Every episode of Flatpak is split up into five scenes. When setting up the scenes, you'll need to tell the players what major trouble is in their way. The director sets up the situation in what we like to call a teaser. In a teaser, you paint a picture with the five senses and give the wrenches an idea of where they are and who's around. Remind the wrenches why they're in on the scene in the first place, just in case they've forgotten. Introduce any rivals or helpers that might be around. Point out the wall in their way, and if the scene has a twist, describe it. The wall is the major obstacle that stops the wrenches from progressing through the scene. This could be something literal in the way, like a rapid river, or something more figurative, like a grumpy old who doesn't quite think the wrenches are up to the challenge at hand. Walls are made up of bricks, a metaphorical representation of how difficult it is to overcome the obstacle in the way. Wrenches use their moment in the scene to build a roll, decrease the number of bricks until ultimately the wall is depleted and there's nothing more standing in their way. A wall has a number of bricks equal to the total number of wrenches in play plus one. So if you have a director and four wrenches, well then you've got five bricks in that wall. The director will have to announce what the tricks is for the scene. This is a single number that will add to their roll against the wrenches roll. The tricks can go up or down throughout the scene depending on previous player results. Tricks actually starts a little higher in each consecutive scene within an episode. That emulates rising tension, a common storytelling technique. Twists are some way, mechanically, that the mood or mold of play has switched up somehow. Maybe this is a really tough wall with extra bricks. Maybe you're not using dice to resolve the wall at all. And this scene is going to be managed with a game of tiddlywinks. There's a bunch of examples of similar twists in Manual D of Flatpak Refix the Future. Oh, hey, here's a fun idea from the manual. Got any of those Duplo or Lego blocks laying around? Build a literal wall with the plastic bricks for the tactile joy of pulling the wall apart as you go. A game of flat pack refix the future is divided into scenes, and within a scene, each character gets a moment where they're building a dice roll and then pulling bricks out of the wall to progress through that scene. But who goes first? Who goes next? Should I roll for initiative? Well, slow your roll there, brave wrench. Instead, let's play a guessing game. First thing after the teaser, the director rolls two six-sided die plus the current tricks for the scene. The result is hidden for now. Each player guesses the number, and the player who gets the closest to the actual number without going over it gets to have the first moment in the scene. On a tie, that moment is going to go to the youngest player involved in the tie. From there, the player is the point who goes next, like doing popcorn round robin reading you might have done in school. I go first. When my moment is over, I nominate another player who hasn't already had their moment. We might be strategic about this by discussing plans. I might pick randomly, or maybe I just point to the guy next to me and uh, let it go from there. I love to play games inside of games inside of games. So of course, you know we're doing a guessing game and then playing popcorn to determine order of play. Most of the time, when you're playing Flatback Refix the Future, you're rolling a couple of d6s, or six-sided dice, like you'd get in almost any basic board game. But sometimes the game rules ask you to step up or step down your die. If you've played some other great role-playing games like Cortex System, you're probably already familiar with this idea. The order of steps goes like this. A four-sided die to a six-sided die to an eight-sided die to a 10-sided die to a 12-sided die. If you need to step down a die, it works the same way, but in the other direction. A d12 becomes a d10, becomes a d8, becomes a d6, becomes a d4. We don't go any lower than that because, well, who carries coins around anymore? 
20-sided die obviously exist, but we don't use them because they make the results really silly and swingy. So that's it. If you're going to roll a d6, but something invites you to step that up, you're going to roll a d8 instead. Easy peasy, dust cloud sneezies. Right, now, so, how about your character's moment in the spotlight while playing Flatpak Refix the Future? You're going to need to know how to build a roll to overcome that wall in your way. But wait, first I've got to tell you about the Meostai. Weird name, but it'll make sense in a minute. This die represents your character. You could look at it like your willpower, your force of presence, your place in the universe, your sense of self, or your luck in life. Anyway, as the me part of the Meos die, you get a d6 as the basis for building your role. But no wrench is an island, as the poets say, and sometimes success in life isn't just what you can do for yourself, and it's more about what we can do together. When you're building a role, other players can expend their scraps, more on that later, which can step up your Mia die from a d6 to a d8 and beyond. And that's how the me becomes the us, and we're all the more successful for it. Great work so far, wrenches. We're getting there. You now know about the Mios die, and that's great. You're almost ready to build a roll. Next, let me tell you about flat packs and flat pack die. In story, the main goal for any wrench is to rebuild the world, and one way all wrenches know how to do that is to find and build flat packs. In the before times, companies built these amazing pre-packaged self-propelled flat packs, like Swedish furniture. Only instead of making a coffee table, these boxes open up and self-construct entire small buildings. What's more, a fully built flat pack will provide special disks any old can use to pick up the skills necessary to run whatever community center, business, or care clinic basically overnight. Talk about future-proof design. Out of story. As your wrenches adventure and collect flat packs to rebuild the world better than before, you'll get to assign several flat packs to your character's wrecks, and therefore get special benefits depending on the building type. You might pick up, say, a community dog run that works with your civics grade. As a part of character advancement, sometimes your flat pack can grow from a D6 to a D8 and beyond. You'll also get other bonuses, like a specialty helper to help you build your roles in the future. Oh, and one more thing I maybe should have mentioned earlier. This is a part of character design. When you are selecting your first two flat packs before the game starts, you can choose to drop one to a D4, which gives you the weird version. And that means you bump the other one up to a D8, which grants you that free helper immediately. Whew, that's fun. Flat packs are pretty important. All right. You've learned a ton about flat pack refix the future. Here's how you're going to build a roll to resolve your moments and pull some bricks from that wall. To build a roll, first you have to describe what your character is doing in their moment and what they hope to accomplish, or what you hope will happen if that's a little bit different than what your character intends. It's important for the director to know what your intention is with the roll, that way they can resolve things more fairly. You're going to take your Mia die. You're going to add your flat pack die. Whatever subject is associated with your flat pack, you'll use that letter grade to grant your result a bonus from plus one to plus four. For the most basic role, you'll add these two dice, whatever your subject's grade suggests, and that number is the result of your role. The director is also going to roll 2d6 plus whatever the current tricks is. The number of all of that stuff added together is the director's result. Compare the two results. If you have a higher result, the character's moment goes how you want. You pull a bricks from the wall, nice work. If you exceed the director's results by three, the moment is considered awesome. A little more on that later. But 
for now, it means you pull two bricks. Wow. It also means the tricks goes up by one for the scene because, hey, you raised the bar. If the director's result is higher than yours, you don't get what you want. You'll also lose a heart sharp as you suffer the risk of heartbreak and get pushed out of the scene. On the bright side, the trick goes down by one. So basically you're setting up a layup for the next wrench to go. If you tie, the director will negotiate with you a bit. There's some guidelines for that in manual C. If you roll any ones on any die, the moment becomes weird. Weird is not bad, but more on that later. There are a few things that add to or adjust the role you build, especially when you've got some thingies lying around. If you get a bonus die to your roll from helpers or gadgets or whatever, you can only use the results from two dice of your choice, not all of the dice you roll. More on thingies later. Bam! Done! You're most of the way to learning how to play flat pack. Flat Pack is a game written and built on a few generations of gaming tradition where play is expected to happen in a shared physical space. I want to start off by noting that that isn't the only way to play a game anymore, and the Flat Pack manuals discuss ways to work around this if you're playing in a virtual or asynchronous space. Even if you're at a table and you simply prefer to, you can track everything on paper if you'd rather. But if you are in a shared space, we like a game of flat pack to involve a tactile experience as well as a mental and social one. That might be building a little dice tower, sketching or fiddling if that makes it easier for players to manage their time. It'll for sure involve using different games within your game to resolve scenes without standard dice rolls, be that a game of old May or pickup sticks or whatever you happen to have lying around. But most importantly, we love to use tokens to represent the bonuses you can earn over the course of the adventure. Flatpak uses three distinct types of tokens, called thingies as an umbrella term. Widgets are earned in a few ways, but the most common way is as a bonus when you turn your moment awesome. You can use any sort of token, even healthy snacks like grapes. They're a single use, adding a plus two to any result. You can declare their use before or after rolling. Both are fine. Within the story, widgets are bits and bobs, odds and ends you might easily find anywhere in a trashed world or your own utility belt. Gadgets are tools, even if you have to stretch the definition of a tool a little. A collapsible ladder, sure, but also a duct tape textbook with chapters from a few different books. Gadgets are earned in a few ways, but the best way is to make a called shot in your moment. Gadgets are also a single use bonus die, usually starting from a D6. Scraps are little slivers of paper or notes. You start every episode with three and you can earn them back in play in a few ways, including rolling ones on your dice. When another player is building their role, you can write them a supportive message on a little scrap, pass it over, and it steps up their Mio style. Now that's teamwork. Now we're really moving along, learning about Flat Pack Refix the Future. Next up, a quick one about the other people in the world. Functionally, all of the people and animal people, and robots, and insect friends, and so on, are characters in the story of Flatpak. Obviously, wrenches are special because they're controlled by players, but there are two other important and distinct kind of characters to consider. Usually these characters are role-played by the director, but not always. First, you've got rivals. In Flatpak, we don't like to think in terms of people being good or bad, or even protagonist-antagonist. What matters for a wrench is that sometimes other people's wants and desires are the opposite of the wrench's wants and desires. They might still be friends. They might be ethically antagonistic creeps. Or they might just be robots with no real opinion on the wrench one way or the other. Just, you know, an operating system. 
rivals are often a key part of determining the twist in a scene if there is one. The other important type of character is a helper. Just like the name implies, helpers are characters in the world who are happy to, well, help when the wrenches are out there in a tight spot. There's a few ways to earn a helper, but the most common way is a permanent helper that you get when you upgrade your flat pack to a D8. If you have a helper, once per episode you can call on them. Whatever their dice rating is, usually equal to their flat pack, you can add a die of that value to your roll. As with gadgets, you can roll them, but you can only pick the results of two die when calculating. Like the advice we got all those years ago from Fred Rogers, wrenches are raised and trained to look for the helpers. All right, wrenches, are you ready to mug a little and show off how brave you are? How about trying a cold shot? This is the best and easiest way to earn a gadget for use later on in your adventures. And here's how it works. When you're building a roll, you're gonna make it a little extra hard on yourself. Tell the director what size of dice you want them to step up to. That stepped up die will replace one of their standard D6s. Usually, the director rolls two six-sided die when the player is resisting their roll. In this case, they're rolling a D6 and a D8, D10, or even a D12 if you're feeling really daring. If, while the director is using that bigger die, you still beat their results, you get a gadget equal to the size of the die you gave the director. Now that's a flex. As you know, a game session of Flatback Refix the Future is called an episode, and an episode is divided into five distinct scenes. Scenes are then divided up into moments, which represent the big moves or important events for each wrench as they build their roles to take bricks out of the wall and progress through the scene. A moment can be successful or not. A moment can go awesome or not. A moment can get weird or not. Good and bad is kind of in the eye of the beholder, and we don't use dice to determine how you or your character feel about their experiences. A successful moment is just that. You described what you hoped would happen, built your role, overcame your challenge, and the director's dice roll. Congrats! You got what you hoped for in that moment. Sometimes you might not beat the director, and so you don't get what you want out of that moment. The tricks for the scene goes down by one. You lose a heart shard. If you tie, your director will have some negotiations for you to get some of what you wanted. However, if you built your roll and beat the director's roll by three, your moment is awesome. That comes with some mechanical benefits like getting a widget for future rolls. It'll bump up the tricks for the scene. You'll remove two bricks from the wall. But most importantly, it means your moment is just really impressive. The director will have some advice to help build on what it is you asked for at the beginning of your role to make it all that much more cool. Now, if you roll one on any of the dice you use when building your role, whether that one gets counted in the end result or not, your moment is going to get weird. But don't panic because moments getting weird is not a good or bad thing. You can have an unsuccessful weird moment. You can have a successful weird moment. You can have an awesome weird moment and I guess anything that could be in between. Weird moments can get a little spooky. They can get a little gonzo. They can mess up the story in a strange and interesting way. Or they just make everyone laugh and change their plans for the rest of the scene. Weird isn't an indicator of bad. This is worth repeating. Weird is just that, strange and fun in an unexpected way. You've learned how moments work, the upsides of success when you've built your role, called your shot, and gotten great results. What happens when a moment isn't as successful as you'd hoped? Well, to be short, you lose heart. Well, a little bit of it. Every wrench starts the game off with three heart shards. This is metaphorical and not literal. 
It represents how assuredly your wrench feels about pushing forward. We've all been there. A setback leaves you a little shaky to carry on. Like when you get up on a stage to give a speech and the first words out of your mouth are a mistake somehow. Oh no. Now every paragraph of what you're supposed to say comes a little bit more and more shaky. It's just nerves. Lost heart shards don't heal themselves within an episode of your adventure. There are a few ways to get your heart shards back, like your furisato, or through hacks, which I'll get to in a bit. So what happens when you run out of heart shards? Well, again, this is metaphorical and not literal. The wrench doesn't like drop dead from a heart attack because we simply don't need that sort of thing in this game. In the odd occurrence, where you don't succeed in three separate moments in the course of an episode, well, you go through heartbreak. To use the metaphor I used before, you screw up so much of your speech that you run off the stage crying and have to collect yourself before you can even consider getting back up there, usually with the help of some friends. But really, your wrench is just going to be out of play for the rest of the episode, unless they can get a heart shard back through a hacks or other means. Usually this happens between scenes, not within the scene where you suffer the heartache. And again, this shouldn't be a frequent occurrence based on like how the dice work. But if it does happen, it means you've had such a dramatic moment that your wrench should like narratively be affected by it. It's important, not common, and not dull. We're not talking Grave of Fireflies here, but like Pikachu getting a little X on his forehead thanks to a careless trainer. Impact drama, but not, and never, character death. That's just not a part of Flatpak. Flatpak Refix the Future is what someone might call a rules light system. You can learn enough to play in the first 10 pages of Manual A, after all. Or within about an hour-long video, for example. In designing, when in doubt, we left the rules as simple as possible and avoided adding more and more complicated solutions to more and more nuanced issues whenever or as often as we could. But we still do love a little nuance or at least a little minutia from time to time. So we added hacks for that and a few other reasons. Hacks are optional rules. You don't have to remember or use them if you can't be bothered. Different ways of building your flat pack, managing ties, or building up new helpers over the course of a longer season of play are all hacks. The other great reason for hacks is when you want to ignore the rules entirely and resolve your scene in a different, more avant-garde way. Have your wrenches been shrunk down to the size of mice? Well, you can decide to resolve the scene with a game of literal mousetrap or whatever other board games you happen to have lying around. I mean, just go for it. Up front in Manual A, we recommend using a game of Go Fish as a hack to replace that beloved JRPG pastime, the fishing minigame. As a player, you don't have to worry too much about hacks, or at least knowing that they exist, that's all the purview of the director. But a player is a player is a player. And if you think of hacks that would be helpful in the scene, go ahead and pitch it. You can even write and propose your own hacks at any time. If you and your group love the idea, you should probably write it down and fit it into your adventure notes for future reference and bookkeeping. Just remember, a hacks is always optional. In a game of flat pack, Refix the Future, you have individual character moments in the scene. You have a few scenes in an episode and a bunch of episodes in a season of play. But wait, there's more. You can also use cutaways in a series of adventures to further develop your wrenches, manage their heartache, and just showcase who they are and what they're up to. At the end of any scene, the last player to have a moment should popcorn nominate a wrench they'd like to see get a cutaway, so long as they haven't already had a cutaway in the episode so far. One cutaway per wrench per episode. You can do one of a few things in your wrench's cutaway. You can have your character try to soothe another using the soothing hacks on page 18 of Manual B. This is the best way to get back heart shards. You can have a one moment long side quest to help your people back in your hometown or new friends you've made along the way. 
This is a great place to break out a hacks mini game, like playing a hand of your favorite card game, or maybe some exciting round-based video game everyone enjoys as a participant or the audience. Wait, are you saying I can play a round of Fortnite while playing Flatpak Refix the Future? It's more likely than you think. Rewards for these side quests can be information, advice for the episode, or just a widget. Lastly, you can hit the workshop. Using the Wrenches Workshop hack on page 17 of Manual C, your wrench can start or make progress in their efforts to improve relationships with their helpers or find new helpers to get started with. Flatpak Refix the Future is a narrative role-playing game like Pathfinder, Fate, Daggerheart, Lady Blackbird, and Apocalypse World. Because the word role-playing is right in the umbrella term, you may feel pressured to bring your best with every word, every action, and every beat of the story. Luckily, in an all-ages game, no one is really expected to be a professional voice actor or novelist. With that in mind, I wanted to very quickly mention roleplay, narration, and rolling dice as they relate to each other and exist in the spirit of a game of flatback. Because this is a narrative game, there are going to be times when scenes, moments, and interactions between characters can and should be narrated. That is, described as if from a book or by a worldly storyteller. The wind swept the hollows of the pockmarked desert before you. It howled like a parched and angry beast. Now, you could do your best to make an impression of that howl, wheezing and coughing to indicate the sound, but it wouldn't paint the exact same picture. Narration can describe experiences with a number of senses more than role-playing can. But that's not to say narration is better. It really isn't. Role-playing, that is, acting as your character would act and speaking what they would say, having conversation as your wrench with other wrenches, or maybe, I don't know, singing a little ditty they learned when they were a wee wrench. Well, that's all role-playing. This can be super fun. And it is one of the biggest reasons people want to play role-playing games to begin with. But that's not to say role-playing is more fun than narration. You actually need both. As a player, or in the specific role of the director, you're going to want to have a mix of both. If you're not much of a creative writer or storyteller, it's okay to pull back on the narration. And if you're shy or not too interested in acting, then you can pull back on the role-play. Both ways of playing support each other. Then what about rolling dice? Is that less important than narration and role-playing? Well, no, not really. This isn't playing pretend or full improv theater. As a result, you need dice or some other scene resolution mechanic to keep the game a game. But I would say it's safe to say that rolling dice follows role-play and narration, not the other way around. Rolling dice is the reaction to the adventure, the story, the narration, and the role-play rather than what causes it. Flatpak Refix the Future frames character development and planning your adventure through a structure similar to the patterns of a TV show or a novel. As I hope you've already put together, any significant action a character does that involves building a dice roll is called a moment. Each wrench gets a moment in any given scene. A scene, then, is a situation with a clear goal or method for progressing through it. This is made up of a series of moments, one for each wrench. When you string a couple of scenes together, usually five, over the course of a session of play, well, that's an episode. So what happens when you string a couple of episodes together? Well, if it's a pair or three of episodes, we usually call that an arc. And if it's a couple of arcs, then that's a season, just like in a TV show. This isn't just significant narratively, this all connects to character advancement, too. In scenes, you may develop your wrench by earning them widgets or gadgets, losing heart shards, and using scraps. Between scenes and a cutaway, you might hit the wrench workshop and build up your relationship with helpers, or visit your hometown and have a side quest where you earn widgets and other goodies. Or maybe you recover some heart shards with the help of a soothing hacks. After an episode, not too much changes about the character, but you will refresh your scraps, your heart shards, and if you want, swap out any flat packs if you have multiple given the same given subject. When you finish an arc, 
you should earn a new flat pack. This is also a good time for trading flat packs amongst the players. At the end of a season of play, you can raise one of your subjects a whole letter grade. Wow! You can also raise a flat pack up a step die and earn whatever comes along with that, such as getting a new helper. You can also flip a weird flat pack into a normal D6 version. If that feels a little slow for you and your group, I wrote an accelerated structure in Manual C on or about page 19. Okay, I wrote an entire manual that focuses on advice and system tools for a director. That's going to allow them to make the most of their experience managing a game of Flatpak Refix the Future. I could do a whole series of videos breaking down the manual on its own, but my time is limited. Years of teacher training, study, and research went into it. And that's not even accounting for all of the game design and game running experience that's helped me build it out. Ah well, maybe someday I'll make that guide for everyone via video. In the meantime, you know, you can read the manual. Anyway, there is one aspect of direction that is so important and so core to what makes Flatpak Flatpak, I felt they had to call it out. I'd be remiss to not wrap up with it. Fair play matters. Strictly speaking, fair play as a literary tool is something I learned about in relation to mystery fiction. In that genre, fair play is finding the balance between creating a mystery and still leaving enough clues around that a reader feels satisfied when the truth is revealed. Maybe they guessed ahead, but not too far ahead, or at least with a few twists to make them doubt themselves along the way. Or, when the reveal happens, the reader says, of course, why didn't I realize that? Ugh, what a clever creator behind this mystery. Either way, the reader needs to be left with a feeling of how clever about themselves or about the story and therefore about themselves for having chosen to read the story in the first place. The opposite of this is a mystery that isn't mysterious or the resolution is not built on evidence presented for the reader to see and experience. That leaves everyone frustrated instead of feeling clever about it. In terms of flat pack, fair play is about a balance of a slightly different kind but with the same ultimate results. To keep me from going on too long about it, fair play in a game of flat pack is about the director setting down the puzzles, clues, characters, and opportunities for the wrenches to succeed brilliantly and for the players to feel clever as every episode wraps up. For example, if a player comes up with a solution to their current predicament that you hadn't thought of, but it makes perfect sense with everything that they've experienced in the story so far, guess what? They're absolutely right. Their good idea should trump your best laid plans every single time. Fair play is for players to use with other players too, be it through scraps, planning out your flat pack layout, trades, or even using your popcorn order to its best advantage. Players can set each other up to shine and really be as awesome as possible. Fair play is the first steps to assuring you have fun play especially in a game of flat pack refix the future.